Hi, Mr. Pulley here for History of Western Civilization at Fieldcrest High School. Uh, looking today at world religions. Again, wait, we've covered Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That's all the Middle Eastern religions. What's left? What? India? Oh, yeah. We're not talking about outsourcing. We're talking about Hinduism and Buddhism. So this is going to be a Western civilization quick look at Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, sort of an overview of these things. Again, this is going to be for more future reference for us as we get to ages of exploration and those interactions between European explorers and these ancient civilizations. Okay, Hinduism believes that there's a single force in the universe, an ultimate reality, if you will, or a god uh, called Brahman. And it's the duty of the individual self, or Atman, has the duty to seek this god, or Brahman, and try to uh, make conscious connection with it. Okay, Self would then, if they made this connection, uh, then be with Brahman, or God, after death much like we would go to heaven after death, if that's our beliefs. Reincarnation is a belief that an individual soul is reborn in a new form after death, and this process can go on many, many, many times. After a number, however, of these uh, rebirths, the souls will finally reach union with Brahman after they've gone through the right things and, and been purified enough. Okay, This is then, of course, the goal of all living things not just humans, to kind of move up in a scale eventually to reach Brahman. Okay, Hinduism believes that there is a force generated by a person's actions in their lifetime that determines how a person will be reborn in the next world or in the next life. And that is, of course, a term you guys are familiar with and heard of. That's the concept of karma. Now, an individual's current status is the result of their actions in the past existence, okay? The better you were, you were in the past, the better your current status is going to be in this lifetime. So, karma is ruled by a set of divine laws. It's called dharma. And if you follow your dharma, you're going to have to follow these duties and you're going to get good karma, which is the idea of duties vary also, however, based upon where you fall in society. People higher in social status have to have more uh, rules and duties that they have to follow to get their karma. It's sort of an idea that the lower the status, you've got some basic things to do, but the more advanced you become, the more advanced things that you have to do as well. And a simple thing I always tell my students, if you follow your dharma, you're going to get good karma. Okay, so moving on in Hinduism, Indian society had these very rigid social class divisions. It's a caste system. And this system had, again, as we said, extra requirements on the upper class, but those extra requirements in their dharma justified their privileges that they had in life. And the fact that you had fewer requirements was justification, I guess, for your lower position in life. Okay. They develop a practice of yoga, which is a method of training to try and reach that human, union with Brahman. Uh, and yoga, in fact, is means union, which is kind of a dreamless sleep. And you just thought it was a type of pants. Okay. Ordinary Indians, however, needed a more concrete form of salvation and, and uh, idealism, or less idealism. And as a result, we have this development into hundreds of human-like deities that make it a little easier for the lower classes to relate to. So there are three chief deities in Hinduism, the first of which is Brahma, the creator. Next, we have Vishnu, the preserver. And finally, we have Shiva, the destroyer. Creator, preserver, destroyer, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Okay, many Hindus view these gods and goddesses as different expressions, however, of the one reality again, Brahman. Okay, but the deities give ordinary Indians, as I mentioned earlier, a way to express their religious feelings, uh, a little more a way to sort of connect on a more individual level with an individual feeling or problem. Uh, today, Hinduism is the religion of the majority of the Indian people, and the cycles of rebirth will lead to something new, uh, and that something new is Buddhism. So Buddhism begins in India in the 6th century BC, um, and essentially to me it's almost like a way of trying to get out of that cycle of reincarnation in one lifetime. That's not really what the Buddha set out to do, so let's find out what he had in mind. Okay, It starts in northern India. We've got uh, a 
prince uh, named Siddhartha Gautama, uh, and he is a prince living in royalty, living in uh, luxury, a great life. Uh, his parents actually keep him from seeing anything bad or evil or even sickness. Um, he becomes known as the Buddha uh, later on in life or the enlightened one. Okay? He again is the son of a, a ruling family, lives in the lap literally of luxury, a sheltered life. Marries a princess, you know, life's good, starts a family, everything's great until it's not. One day he goes out, uh, supposedly the story is he sneaks out and he sees suffering in society. He sees old people, he sees sick people, and he's like, the effects of old age. He's like, what's going on here? How come I've never seen this before? And he realizes there's a lot more to life than my life, and there must be something going on. So he leaves his family, uh, leaves his royal life, shaves his head, and goes off to find what the meaning of life actually is, now that it's not what he thought it was. So he's out there and he follows the example of the ascetics. And the ascetics are these guys who practice self-denial, um, literally um, like starving themselves, trying to understand the ultimate reality, meditating, um, fasting. And he almost dies from not eating and figures out, well, that's not going to help me either. So he turns to intense meditation. A Hindu way to find oneness with God is a way to hopefully he can find what the answer to the meaning of life actually is. And the story is one day he's sitting under a uh, meditation tree and he reached enlightenment uh, and sees uh, and he starts then teaching what he's learned to everybody else. He says the way to uh, achieve enlightenment is to deny the reality of the material world. The material world, the physical surroundings around us are simply an illusion. We make them up, essentially. He said pain, poverty, and sorrow are all caused by attachment to things of this world. So it's this concept of bodhi or wisdom and this wisdom, this bodhi achieving this is seen as the key to reaching nirvana, which is the, the ultimate reality, this reunion with the great world soul uh, and that should be the goal. And he comes up with a series of ways for us to get to that. Now this middle way is also known as the Eightfold Path, so let's run through these eight steps of what is the Eightfold Path. And they are, first of all, right view. Know those four noble truths. Then right intention, okay? That is, what is it we really want? What is our actual intention in life? Okay, right speech, speak the truth, speak well of others. Okay. And finally, right action, okay? Do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, uh, do not be unchaste, and do not take drugs or alcohol. Boy, it's a, like a whole lot of the uh, Ten Commandments all in one sort of step. Again, the middle way, also known as the Eightfold Path, okay? The first is right livelihood, some kind of uplifting work. You don't have to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer, uh, but to do things for to help people, whether it be cleaning, cooking for them, whatever it is, I'm doing things to help other people. Okay, the right effort. I'm going to be steady in my example, uh, not too radical or anything, and always set a good example for others to follow. And then right mindfulness. Okay, I want to keep control of my senses. And finally, right concentration. Meditating to see the world in a new way. So through meditation, one can learn to view the world as a more spiritual place with less earthly desires, uh, less selfishness. And this is the way the last of those Eightfold Path steps to reach nirvana. Like Hinduism, Buddhism accepts the idea of reincarnation, but there are some parts of it it does not accept. Okay, It rejects that rigid social caste system that uh, was in India, uh, which is interesting because uh, Sanatha Gautama, the Buddha, would have been at the very top of that system. Okay, It appeals to lower class people, the lower castes, uh, because of this. Um, and also with this idea that you could reach nirvana not by going through several lifetimes and reincarnations, but in one lifetime based on your accomplishments and actions in this lifetime. He also rejects that multitude of Hindu gods. He said this was a uh, simplistic concept for people that uh, they don't really need. He forbids the worship of his person or body or his image. Uh, the idea is you're supposed to respect the idea, not me as a person who brought the ideas. And many, because of this, see Buddhism more as a philosophy and not so much always as a religion. The Buddha dies in Nepal, uh, north of India, in 480 BC, uh, and it becomes more common as a practice of worship outside of India. 
Given the fact that it would help all the people of the lower caste, you'd think it would catch on in India, but most people stick to tradition. And so in India, it doesn't really catch on. It spreads throughout uh, other parts of there, again, being in northern India, but it's more common in um, China, in uh, Thailand, uh, even over into Japan, Korea, uh, those areas than it is actually in India. Finally, one last note for those of you who were observant earlier. Uh, no, this is not a swastika on the uh, Buddha. That is a, a sign of love, a sign of life. It's used in not only Buddhism, but also Hinduism. Uh, and even Native American tribal groups use this, the Hopi Indians for one, um, it, where they see it as the sign of life. Uh, look here, this is the Buddhist symbol. This is the Nazi swastika. The uh, Buddhist symbol, you can see versus the swastika, that it's reversed and twisted. In fact, the Hopi Indians have a saying about the three great shakings of the earth and the second great shaking, which people say is the first and second world wars, the second great shaking being the second world war, is that uh, there are two signs of that. One, that the sun would rise in the west and the other that the sign of life would be twisted in the east. Well, this is the twisted sign of life in the east of the, from the United States, Nazi Germany. And let's see, west of us was the empire of the rising sun, Japan. Hey, thanks for watching. It's a quick overview of Hinduism and Buddhism. I'm Mr. Pulley.